Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 234th episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest in today's podcast is Johan Harrison. Johan is the founder of Money Script Wealth Management, an RIA based in Cedar Hill, Texas, that offers ongoing financial planning services to 225 upwardly mobile young healthcare professionals for a combination of monthly subscription fees and getting paid for subsequent implementation. What's unique about Johans, though, is that the value he offers his clients revolves around helping them identify and change their own preconceived notions about and relationship with money, their personal money scripts, to help them make money decisions that are better aligned with their financial goals. In this episode, we talk in depth about how Johans helps his clients recognize and understand their personal money scripts, which so often influence our financial decisions without us even being aware it's happening, and what Johans does to help them subsequently change their money scripts for the better how Johans developed his niche serving physicians and other healthcare workers, and the way he helps them not become a target for their other family members when they suddenly start generating a higher income. And how early in his career, Johans recognized that his lack of a natural market meant that his best path to success would be to get a better focus on a value proposition that could bring referrals to him instead. We also talk about Johans' financial planning process itself how he starts with a deep examination of a client's budget to find the various paths they can take to make small incremental changes and progress towards their goals, how Johans positions and prices his various monthly subscription fee tiers ranging from silver to diamond, so he's able to effectively and profitably serve clients along a complexity spectrum, and how by going outside of his comfort zone to include a request for referrals as a part of his email workflow, not asking in a meeting, Johans has enjoyed the highest rate of growth he's ever seen. And be certain to listen to the end, where Johan shares how he gives clients personal links to his calendar as a deliberate means of creating a business model that actively promotes access to information and advice. Johan's own experience with building diverse and inclusive teams and how the best way for the industry to attract diverse talent may simply be putting diverse advisors into leadership roles. And how Johan has come to appreciate how much greater his impact can be as a financial advisor after he realized he needed to start building out his own team in order to reach more clients. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Johans Harrison. Welcome, Johans Harrison, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thank you, Michael. So excited to be here with you today. Can't wait. I I really appreciate you coming out and joining us on the podcast to Talk a little bit about your your journey through the advisory business, and and just I think is an, an kind of an interesting approach to 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 building the practice and biz- positioning the practice the way that you have. You know, I know you you've you built a firm called Money Script Wealth Management. Have a podcast, The Money Script, and you know, just I've done a lot of work around the, the sort of these themes and intersections of financial planning, financial literacy, and and our money scripts, which. Yeah, I feel like there's sort of an interesting split in our industry. A few people that have uh, kind of gotten familiar with discussions around money scripts and, w- and what they are and what they mean, and and have you know read work from folks like Kaler and Klontz who've who've done a lot of writing around this, and then a lot of us that just never necessarily spent any time on this at all and, and may not even be familiar with it. And and so I I thought maybe to to kick off like I'd love to just hear from you more about like where this whole theme for your business came from around money scripts to the point that it is literally the, the title of the business and the and the podcast and so front and center. Uh, well, again, thank you and, and appreciate the the opportunity to to join with all of your listeners here. This is one of my favorite podcasts in my top 10. I, I really appreciate the um, the breadth of different advisors and stories that you bring in, into the space. And so with money scripts or the, the idea of money scripts, it, it came to me, it was introduced to me probably a decade ago. And, but it was, it was introduced in the form of, of a money story. Someone asked, you know, what, what's your money story? And in the beginning, I didn't really know what they meant about money story, but as they continued to ask me the questions, I started to think a lot about my childhood. And I come from a background where my mother was disabled when I was a, when I was a teenager, 
my father didn't make the best financial decisions. They, my family had to file for for bankruptcy. Their their home was foreclosed. Uh, I remember one morning when I was a, a driver at the time, and I woke up one morning to go pick up all the my friends in my mother's van because she couldn't drive anymore. And I got into the habit of picking people up and giving them rides to school because you know gas was only a dollar back then, so everyone got charged a dollar, and I get a full tank of gas. But I woke up one morning, the car was gone, the van was gone, and I'm freaking out. Dad, someone stole the van. And he said, well, I guess you have to take the bus to school. I'm like, dad, you're not understanding. Someone stole the van. And he wasn't as emotionally charged as I was. But as I continually to continue to to poke and prod on it, he eventually just yelled at me and said, take the bus to school. And he used some choice words there. And when I came home from school on the bus, my father, you know, invited me to come with him to go pick up the van. And I was like, oh, you, you found it. Well, that's awesome. I mean, that's my, some teenagers just joyriding. Let me know who it is. You know, I, I know people in the neighborhood. And I watched as he went next door to the neighbor and I saw the neighbor give my dad a, a lot of cash. We got into his truck and we drove to a um, storage yard, if you will. I saw the money exchange hand, signed some paperwork, they gave my dad the key and my dad threw the key to me and he said, come on, let's go home. And it wasn't until... And, and no, and we didn't talk about it at all. And it wasn't until years later, a couple of years later, that my father shared with me that that day the car had been repossessed or the van had been repossessed. And I didn't even know what repossession meant. And he also explained to me that the, that they don't own the house anymore, that they're renting the house. And he started to kind of open up about some of his financial struggles. And it was through that individual asking me the questions about the money story. It, she ended with, well, how do you think that affects your financial decisions today? And I couldn't really make a connection because I left home, went to college and started a financial services career and just started working with lots of people with, with money. And then I realized I was like, wait, I really don't understand a lot about money myself. I mean, I understand enough to have my licenses and talk to people about IRAs and 401ks, but I didn't understand the psychology behind financial decisions. And so I just started to pour into that and reading lots of books about financial behaviors and the psychology of money and, and things of that nature. And that's when I came across the idea of a money script. And that just kind of resonated with, with me a little bit more than money story. And part of that was because of my love for theater and the way I looked at it is like, okay, so we have money, which is this, this, this medium of, of exchange for goods and services. And then we have uh, the definition of script, which is, you know, kind of a, a, a written method or dialogue or a recipe of how things are to get done. And that's when it just hit me. I was like, yes, everyone has these money scripts in their head. They have the, what they, how they understand money and, and how they've programmed them themselves, how they've programmed themselves to act and react in certain situations. And it happens in less than half a second. You know, if you, if you, you're in a position where you're like, okay, my car broke down or my car's not working anymore. I need a car. Should I buy or lease? And a lot of times people arrive to the decision very, very quickly without thinking about all the other financial things that have, that have gone on in their life or whether it's a decision to how they're going to decide to to pay for school or even something as simple as pay for groceries after they've lost a job. They've already got these scripts in their head that they just their mind, you know, like I said, it happens in a fraction of a second. They go through, read the script or recite the script in their head subconsciously. And the next thing you know, they've made a financial decision without sitting down to think about like, wait, wait, why, why? Is my script written this way? And and then being able to realize that, wait, you're the actor, the director, the producer, you're the you're the entire cast and crew of this script that you've created, and you can rip it up and start writing a new one, but first you have to recognize the one that's already in your head. So so that's where it came from. So once I had decided I was uh, going to start my own company, I remember when uh, when my wife asked me, like, what are, what are you going to call the company? And it was. It was instant. I said the money script is is what I, what I started with. But then after doing a little doing a little research and, and talking to some clients, I was like, ah, I should probably have wealth and management in there because that's ultimately what I'm trying to attract. So it became money script wealth management, and then I decided to or um, a marketing and, and publications arm as the money script, and and that was the birth of the podcast. Very cool. And and so, like, who does the advisory firm serve? Well, like, what is your what is your typical client? So uh, when I started my career at American Express Financial Advisors back in 2001, one of the first clients that I got, because you, you, when, when you start off in, as an advisor, they, they talk to you a lot about, you know, your first 30 or 40 clients, you know, that's really going to define the type of practice that you're building. One of my, or multiple, a few of my first few clients were, were physicians. And one of them in particular, 
it's interesting to note that, that she, from her and her referrals to this day, 20 years later, they still make it, they make up about 70% of my practice. It can all be traced back to this one physician. So a lot of the clients that uh, MoneyScript works with are physicians and, and nurses and physician assistants. Actually, they just voted to change their name to physician associates. And they are, a lot of them are emergency physicians, OBGYNs, some family doctors. So, so a lot of my, my, um, my clients are in that space. And, and really because, uh, well, they, they also love the name Money Scripts because it reminds them of prescription. And I have my clients and other doctors that will say to me at the end of the session, all right, what's my prescription? So I think that's kind of, <laughs> kind of cool. I've, I've, I've really uh, taken on to that. A lot of the clients that we work with have come from individuals that just graduated out of a nursing program or um, maybe just transitioned from residency to being a practicing physician. So uh, a lot of our clients have a lot of student loan debt, but they have, you know, they have good income. And sometimes they've come, they have a money script in their head that doesn't quite match the, the income and the financial power that they now have. And so they have to, we have to work with them a lot to help them rewrite those scripts. Right. Just all those weird dynamics that happen when you're, well, in general, when you're a student and suddenly you like graduate and get a job and you know at any job when you've never had a job is like more money than you're <laughs> ever used to having around perhaps even more so in in industries like medical services healthcare where you know you can live very lean and rack up a lot of debt as a student and suddenly when you finally get through school and residency and the rest and suddenly have that that fully minted job like your your income absolutely catapults from where it was but you spent the past three, five, seven, 10 years trying to live like a pauper on almost nothing. And it's a really hard adjustment for some people. It is. And, and they, 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 they tend to develop this very peculiar relationship with debt because especially the ones that have 200, 300, $400,000 worth of student loan debt, because they try to put themselves in a position where it doesn't burden them or because it is the last thing you want your, your ER physician as you're being wheeled into the hospital. You don't want them worried about how am I going to pay my student loan this month? Or, oh my gosh, the interest on my student loans is just so, so horrible. So they, they've learned how to compartmentalize and kind of ignore it, but almost to their own detriment. And like you said, they'll, they'll go from making, and this is, this is what really happens. I mean, they'll go two years making $3,000 a month. And then all of a sudden in June of the, you know, that, of that second year, instead of making $3,000, they make 30. And that can be, that, that's a, that can be a tough transition. And, and I've, I've watched sometimes the, as they, they call the, the windfall or the lottery effect can really hinder a lot of them and their ability to make smart financial decisions again, because of their previous scripts. And there's, there's a lot of doctors out there whose parents aren't doctors. You know, they come from very impoverished families and their parents are struggling and their siblings are still struggling, but they're the ones that made it out and became a doctor. And then they have that overnight success and, you know, they want to help everybody. And want so you're to- making the money now. It's so like, you're going to help, you're going to help all the family, right? Like all the family, right? Mm-hmm. They, they become the bank and everybody's calling. I mean, I, I have one of the rules that I've set up with some of those clients is as I learn some of those things about them, say, all right, we're going to set up a family fund. And when your family calls you from help, it comes from that fund. If that fund is out of money, you don't have any money to help them. So and, and, and a lot of clients have, have appreciated that because it's help, it's empowered them to be able to say, I don't have it. And I tell them, I'm like, they're going to look at you like, what do you mean you don't have it? You're a doctor, aren't you? I like, I said, and also you can send them a copy of your student loans and say, well, when I get this paid off, then maybe I'll have it. But until then, I've got to make up for the 12 years I spent in school where I didn't have it. And now just because my name is doctor doesn't mean that you know, I'm, I'm just, I can become the bank for the family. So. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting dynamic. So that, that's where a lot of our, our clients come from. But at the same time, we, we are, we're referral based. So um, I learned very early on to ask for referrals. I've got a process that I put in place where I'm consistently asking clients for referrals as they get through different steps of the financial planning process and they refer. Like I said, I've got a system in place where my assistant reaches out to them and next thing I know, they, they end up on the calendar and, and, it, and it works. So I decided not to try to fix it or prod with it. I just keep doing the same system that I was taught way back at American Express 20 years ago. And it continues to work to this day. It's, it's one of those, if it ain't broke, I'm not going to try to fix it. So I, I, I definitely want to come back and hear more about just what the referral process looks like in practice. But first, just help me sort of complete the understanding of just the the advisory firm as it exists today. So, so it's like working sort of heavily with young professionals. I'm, I'm going to presume like basically a lot of people in their 
30s because that's sort of by the time you get through all the medical education, the residencies and the rest and kind of get through it and have the income pop and the student loan pop and all of that hit at once. Like we're, we're now into our 30s and then that's where you end up with a lot of clients. Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely true. So I, I went through a 10-year a period where I had zero, even negative client growth. And that's because I was, I was in leadership at, at my previous firm. So when I went and when I started the money script and I went back out to start actively marketing again, the new clients, yes, they were all in their mid 30 or excuse me, late twenties to, to early thirties. So I've got a bit of a barbell practice because I have the clients that have been with me from the last 15 to 20 years. And then I have all the clients that have joined in the last say five years and all of, and uh, I won't say all, but the large majority of those clients, yes, they're in their, their late twenties, early thirties, you know, just starting out with the buying homes. I mean, I think it was in 2019 inside the practice over 20, I think it was 26 homes were purchased first time home buyers. So, so now there, were, there were so many gifts going out for, for, um, for, for new homes. Lately, as I look at my gift log, what's on there now is all piggy banks for children. So, so it's, it's a lot of young families that are just you know, at the beginning of their financial journey and learning how to manage their student loans. And, and you know, everyone's grateful for the reprieve they've had on student loans for the last what, almost 18 months now. And so we're spending a lot of time right now. A lot of our clients are coming to our workshops to talk about, you know, what are we going to do in October when the moratorium on, on student loan payments ends? Uh, what are we doing about refinancing student loans? How do we fit this? I mean, this, this wasn't has for our, our, our doctors and nurses that graduated last year. They haven't made a student loan payment yet um, because the, the, the moratorium was there because of COVID. So, so now it's like, okay, well, all right, I did what you told me. I've been setting all this money aside. You're telling me I'm not going to be able to put money in my Roth anymore because I have to start putting money in the student loan. It's like, eh. Yes, that's kind of what I'm telling you right now. So congratulations. We, we, you know, we got a year head start on that Roth IRA, but yeah, and we're going to have to put that money in student loans. So, so yeah, it's, it's, um, so our, I don't know the latest percentage, but I know last time I counted it was in the upper 70% of our clients are, are on a financial planning relationship where they are on either a, a monthly or a quarterly meeting basis where we're um, going in and help them building up, build out their financial plan prioritizing their goals and putting all the money into the right areas and in the right buckets and, and also going through the financial literacy process. We have a lot of sessions with clients where it's not really about products. It's not really about, you know, hey, we're going to move this money around. I know I'm actually going to teach you the difference between a stock and an ETF, or I'm going to teach you the if you're a business owner, a new doctor, a new business owner, let's just talk about the different types of retirement plans that are out there. Or let's just talk about how, you know, how lending works for a for a student loan, for a home, for a credit card and just educating them, helping them on that education that they didn't get in school. So, so that's, that's really what the money script is here to do is to provide that financial literacy, especially to the younger clients. It's not, we're not discriminating against, yes, I, for my clients to hear this, yes, I will still work with your parents and grandparents, but, but we feel that, that we can provide some of the greatest value to the people that don't have the assets yet, but have the work ethic and the money that goes along with it and have a, a, a huge desire to learn how to change some of their habits and make better financial decisions. So what is the business model for how you guys operate? I mean, what are you what are you doing to actually get paid for this? Are you in a realm of assets under management, charging financial planning fees, charging subscription fees, you know, particularly with younger clients or younger clients with debt where I'm presuming there's not a not a lot of sizable IRA rollovers. <laughs> like what's the what's the business model for for how you're serving these clients? The business model begins with a financial plan. So uh, clients are going to engage in a financial advisory service where they are going to pay a subscription fee. I'm, I'm a, I, thanks to your blogs and podcasts, I, I was listening to one of them and heard about advice pay. And I said, now that's awesome. That's something I can get on board with. And, and I did. Uh, I started with advice pay, I think, three years ago, if it's been around that long. Oh, yeah. Know. Yeah. You were early. But I yes. Was, I was early and it was exactly what I needed to really deliver the financial advice in the way that, that, that I wanted to, wanted to. And, um, so, so we, we use, so clients, uh, when, when they come or excuse me, when a prospect comes to a discovery session, they get 45 minutes with me. I will offer the 45 minutes. I don't have a, a screener or anything like that that says, if you don't have this much money or this much income or what have you, you can't have the 45 minutes. If you can find the 45 minutes in my calendar, it's yours. 
So I'll spend 45 minutes with them or up to 45 minutes because sometimes you can get cut short, but I'll spend 45 minutes and understand, you know, what their goals are. And then I'll offer a subscription based financial advisory service to them where they can, you know, pay anywhere from a hundred dollars a month, 200 a month, 300 a month, depending on the complexity of situation, or I'll offer to them to do it on a quarterly basis. From there, we'll go into a um, data gathering meeting where I tell them it's time to get financially naked. Um, I want to know everything. I use e-money for financial planning. So I have clients connect all of their accounts to e-money. I have an analyst that goes through and helps them build out their budget. Cause I'd say, tell every client, you, you got to have a budget. You have to, uh, if you don't like the word budget, you got to have a spending plan, whatever, whatever th they need to hear to understand that this is going to be the basis of all of their other financial decisions. And you build the budget in e-money like you try to do the budgeting and the tracking yeah we build, so e so e-money so e a little little known secret about e-money there is a a client side to e-money where clients can go in and build their budget so most clients don't understand how to do it so e-money gives us as advisors access to that as well and so we'll go in and, and put in um, different rules so that it will remember every time it sees a check for eighteen hundred dollars that's rent or every time it sees a, a Zelle for $50, that's the housekeeper. So we'll set all those rules and then it will build itself into a budget. And then we take that budget information back to the client side of eMoney and plug it into their to their spending goals to so that you can extrapolate, okay, how much are they spending on an annual basis on their discretionary expenses versus fixed expenses, liabilities, et cetera. And I learned that by doing it that way, uh, we're able to build more realistic financial plans versus in the old days when I would do it, if the client didn't, you know, if they weren't handwriting what their budget is themselves, they would just tell me, oh, I spend 5,000 a month. It's never true. As a matter of fact, I've, I've done, I've been doing this for investigative research pur purposes. I have a questionnaire that I send to clients. And one of the questions says, what are your total monthly expenses? And then I put in parentheses, include everything, liabilities, payments, credit card payments, you know, include everything on average, what are your monthly expenses? Less than 5% of people put in a number that's within 10% of the correct number. Okay. And, and every time they'll, you know, they'll put, oh, it, it's 3000 a month. And then I'll go through their analysis and email and I'm like, well, actually it's more like five, you know? And so, and it also helps us build more realistic cash reserves. Because I, I'm a strong believer that a cash reserve starts with one month of your total expenses and you build it to two, then you build it to three. And then the next goal is six months. And as you get to, as you approach retirement, I like to have a full year worth of cash reserves. And it hasn't served me wrong in 20 years because I've had clients to graduate right into COVID. I had clients, excuse me, graduate, retire right into COVID. I had clients uh, that were retiring right into the, the financial crisis of 08. I had clients that were retiring into the financial, the, the tech crisis back in the early 2000s. So having that that bigger cash reserve has served wonders. So so that, so that from the data gathering and the analysis, then I go and say, okay, well, here's the recommendations. Uh, you should think about a Roth IRA. You should you know maximize your 401k at work. You should look at life insurance. So we're also, I'm a life insurance agent. My wife, who is my director of operations, she's also a life insurance agent. She really runs a lot of the insurance practice. Insurance takes a lot of time and in energy. Um, and I'm focused on the planning side. So she, she's been um, taking that on more and more. And I have an account specialist who's also an insurance agent. So if I see insurance opportunities, be it term life, disability life, long-term care, whatever it is, then I'll introduce them to Alicia or to Alexis and, and they'll continue to help them through that process while I continue to work on, you know, starting to opening up some of the, the accounts, whether it's the Roth IRA, the, the investment account, the UTMA or or, or the 529 plan or, or whatever it may be. And, and then from there, it just goes into a, a review process. So we, from that final meeting, depending on, not final meeting, excuse me, but from that implementation or that action session, as we call it, from there, which usually takes about 90 days to get someone from discovery session to action sessions where they're actually setting up the accounts or they're you know rolling over whatever money they may have or looking at the insurance. From there, depending on their level of financial education, we will either go into a a monthly um, follow-up sessions where they're getting that financial education for 30 to 30 minutes to an hour, depending on what it is on a monthly basis, or if they need a lot of help in budgeting, or they'll go to a quarterly review session where, and I'll set that meet, I'll set those meetings right then using, what do I use? Um, one sub. So for, for calendar, which I, I probably got from one of your blogs somewhere where I was looking, okay, who do I want to use for, for my calendar agent? Yep. So that, that's the scheduling app. Once, uh, once hub is a uh, like Calendly competitor. Yes. Yes. And so then I'll go, uh, I have some templates built out in there where we will go and we'll choose, you know, quarterly meetings for the rest of the year. So we'll go and book those quarterly meetings or we'll choose the monthly and we'll go book 12 meetings. And usually we, 
I say to clients all the time, you don't know what you're doing on December 3rd, but I do because I have my calendar, my off days built out for the rest of the year. So let's put it on December 3rd at five o'clock. Perfect. Okay. And we'll do it three months later, the same two, first Tuesday of the month at five o'clock and then three months later, et cetera. And clients love it. If, if the, when the meeting comes close, if uh, they get a reminder and if they need to reschedule it, they can just click and do that themselves, you know, or they'll reach out to my assistant if they you know, don't have the technical savvy to do that part. So it really makes it easy to manage staying a part of the client's lives and their financial decisions from there on out. Cause clients would, they'll save up all their questions. Like, Hey, I, just yesterday, last night I w- was with the client. Like, okay, I know we only have an hour. I'm sure you have an agenda, but yo, I've got, you know, about 10 questions. I need to rapid fire ask you another like, go. And, and it's great. Cause these are questions they've been saving up for the last three months. And you know, they don't email, they won't text. I mean, I tell them if it's urgent, you know, email me, text me to set up a meeting or what have you. But for the most part, they will save it all into the meeting, which is, which I think is, is good that they're, starting to create that relationship with me where they know they have an outlet. They know they have some place that they can go and they can get the answers to their financial questions. So the ongoing model is kind of anchored to this monthly subscription fee for what are monthly or quarterly meetings checking in on, I guess, all financial planning stuff, but it sounds like in practice, check-ins are very, very budgeting oriented. A, a, a lot of them are. Yes. A lot of them are very budgeting oriented because I, I, I guess that's what I've, because we've got really good at that as a practice, that's what we tend to create are people that really want that help in budgeting that want to, you know, that know they, they, they should improve their dining out budget or that know they need to improve their shopping budget or know they just need to be more aware of, of how their children are <laughs> ordering things on their iPhone and things of that nature. And, and or looking for ways, you know, so I'll give you a great example. It's very rare that we will meet with a client, no matter what age, no matter what money they're, they're making, where we can say, hey, you're doing everything right. You're going to be a retire when you want to or have financial independence when you want to. More often than not, people want to have financial independence sooner and want to have more money and more choices. So in the financial planning uh, process, we'll say, OK, well, if you want to, you know, have financial independence by the time you're 60, you want your kids to be able to, to go to the school they want and not have the kind of debt that you had, you're going to need to have a savings rate of, of 15% of your earnings. Well, right now your savings rate is about eight. So how do we get from eight to 15? Well, you know, you could just flip a light switch and start maxing out your 401ks and start stuffing, you know, thousand a month into your 529 and doing your backdoor Roth IRAs and then problem solved. But that's probably not going to make you very happy because that's also going to mean that you know, you can't take the occasional vacation. You, you know, there's things you won't be able to do if you just turn the light switch and make all of these savings happen right now. So let's talk about how to make them happen over time. So let's. So with every client that once we put, once we have the financial, all their data and have uh, where they're spending all their money in the categories, I just focus on the top five, top five areas that they're spending. So we'll look at 90 days of their spending and, and look at the top five areas. And inevitably, usually one of the top five is going to be mortgage or rent. And with every category, I say to the client, we're going to ask ourselves two questions. The first question is, can you change the number? And the second question is, should you? So for instance, with uh, a mortgage or rent, can you change the number? Eh, probably not. Not today you can't. Could you find a less expensive apartment when your lease is up? Sure, you could. Could you look into refinancing your house to possibly have a, um, a lower payment? Sure, you could. But there's nothing you can do immediately today to change your rent amount next month in most cases. So let's move on to the next category. And typically somewhere in that top five is going to be the category of that is discretionary or the food is going to fall in there. And with food, we'll have an interesting conversation because you can click on e-money, you can click on food in that budgeting and it will tell you how much was dining out, how much was fast food, how much was groceries. And I'll share with clients like, look, let's just be real. You can swap your dining out for groceries and you can get, depending on, on uh, your, your, your level of dining out, you can typically get three to five dollars for every one. Meaning if you put one more dollar in the grocery store, you can reduce your dining out by three to five dollars. But you also are signing up for cooking. Not everybody is prepared to cook. So how can we if, if we if we're looking at this dining out budget or this eating budget and we're seeing that on average, each person in the household is spending eight hundred, nine hundred, a thousand dollars. And trust me, I've seen it a thousand dollars a month on eating. How can we tweak this just a little bit? And, and so I'll typically share a story, not typically, I will share the same story with every single client about a very bad Starbucks habit that I used to have. When I lived in Long Beach, uh, I lived in downtown Long Beach, and 
our offices were on Ocean Boulevard and I was living on Ocean Boulevard as well, four block walk to the office. But on the way to the office, there was a Starbucks and I would literally walk in one door of the Starbucks, get my order and walk out the other door. I I'd convinced myself that that was the most efficient route to get to work. And, and just, that was just kind of part of the pathway. You it was part of the pathway. It was part take of the this pathway. little stroll through. Exactly. Exactly. To the point where I, it, I would, they knew my name. I walk in, yo, you know, they, they knew exactly what I wanted. And, and that was my relationship with Starbucks. Well, as my wife and I started to plan a family, we were looking at ways to <laughs> reduce our spending. Well, we, I already had a son or, um, so we were planning to have a, another child, a second child. We were looking at, okay, where can we cut our, uh, make some changes in our budget. And looking at my spending, I saw, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say this, but I was spending easily three to $400 a month in Starbucks. They got a good business. You got to give them credit. It's, man, a great business. And at the time, it did not own that one Starbucks stock. I was like, what am I doing? At least get your ROI, right? Like recycle, recycle your dollars back in, participate in that dividend. Exactly. Exactly. And so now what I was not prepared to do was to say, I'm never going to Starbucks again. I wasn't prepared to do that, but I was prepared to say, I'm not going to go to Starbucks on Monday anymore. And then Monday turned into Tuesday, Tuesday turned into Wednesday, Wednesday turned into Thursday. And then before I knew it, I was only going to Starbucks once a week. Michael, this was seven years ago. I still go to Starbucks once a week. It's just part of what I do. I enjoy going to Starbucks and, and, and having some expensive coffee in a paper cup. It makes me happy. It makes me feel like oh, I worked hard for this, but I didn't need to do it every day. So slowly over time, you know, by, by, uh, by eliminating that one day, okay, that was, that was 20% of the spending. I'm going five days a week. So all of a sudden my Starbucks went from three to $400 a month to, to, you know, $250 a month or $270, $75. It was, it was really easy to make those changes when I was just making small incremental changes over time. So I'll share that same story with clients, especially when we're looking at their dining out. Cause then I'll click further and, and e-money will show me all the days that they ate out. And I was like, well, look at this on some day, some weeks you're eating out four times a week. What if we just say, we'll only eat out on Friday and Sunday. And I tell them, like, don't let me make the rule. You make the rule. If this is something you want to change, because if you can reduce this area of spending, let's say if we just reduce it by 10%, well, guess what? That's an extra $150 a month, whatever the number is that can go towards whatever goal they have. And so all of a sudden they've now associated something that's very valuable to them with their goals and their financial behaviors. And all of a sudden they start to see some alignment. They're like, okay, wait, I'm willing to change this financial behavior because my kid's education is very, it's, I value education. And I have a goal of making sure that I can provide some funds for them. All I need to do is not eat out as much. Or when I eat out, just eat out, use some more, or just be smarter about eating out. I mean, how many of us take home a doggy bag from our favorite restaurant and the doggy bag goes in the trash two days later? You know, uh, and this is these are, and these are conversations. And I share this with all these conversations that 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 my wife and I we had to have because I was a financial advisor in Southern California. I was making great money. It was not a thing to go out and have a steak dinner, you know, a couple times a week or go to Starbucks every single day. But but starting to associate things that were more important to us and understanding what our values are, and then looking at our financial behavior and just looking at and say, okay, I have the power to make some changes here. What am I willing to do differently? And so sharing that with clients, and that's part of that that. This, for some clients, it's that monthly process of saying, okay, let's look and see how you did on that goal of reducing dining out. And so they're like, oh, yo, I didn't have a good month. I'm like, it's, it's okay. It, it happens. But then I'll show them in some of the other areas and say, well, well, guess what? You also haven't gone on a vacation in six months <laughs> because there's nowhere to go. Um, actually, now the opposite starting to happen in all of our clients' uh, budgets. I'm starting to see vacations start to creep back in there again now that, that the world's starting to open up again. But but being able to to have those consistent conversations going back to what's important for the client, what are your behaviors right now? What can we do different? How can we make a small change? How can we improve by 10% or reduce the expense by 10% and then commit that savings to somewhere else? But just so how uh, take me back once more to just how does this work from the business model end? Because I just I, you know, I I know a lot of advisors that have said like yeah I'd love to to you know, work with my clients on the cash flow and budgeting but holy cow it's labor intensive and I just can't I I, I can't get paid to do this like I, I it's not economically profitable and business viable for me to do this so so take me back just to the I guess the subscription business model end so like how do you is this what's 
essentially covered by the subscription fee? Are there other things covered by the subscription fee? How do you set the subscription fee? Like, What are you doing to make sure you're getting paid for all this stuff? Absolutely. First of all, from a timing standpoint, I don't do all this work. I hired an analyst and it, it is his job to help the clients build their budget. I also use a service called Loom. Loom is a recording subscription where you can record anything that's going on in your screen and then you can send a link to someone. You can even password protect it. So we've we've created some some looms that we can just send to the client of here. Here's how you can go in and modify your budget or here's how you can use the e-money tool to to connect your accounts and all of the good stuff. So so by using that now I don't have to spend you know, that's a, that's a, a seven minute video. Well, I don't have to spend that seven minutes with every single client. I just have to spend the seven seconds of sending them the link to the video and saying, Hey, watch this. Oh, because it's not just that you're doing like, you know, live real time loom videos out to people. It's you've recorded the like onboarding into e-money loom video guide. And like, it's the same video for it's client. the same video with, with Joe and, and Bob or, or Joe and Susie sample client. Yep. So, so that is there. And so going back to, to just the business model. So, so based on the complexity of their situation, I have the, it's uh, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. I think that's how I did it. Oh no, I think I got rid of bronze. I think it's silver, gold, platinum, and diamond. There we go. So there's there's different service mod or, or engagement models that, that clients can can choose from. One is just is going to be really basic. They're not going to get the monthly meetings. They're going to get 90 days of intense work where we'll probably meet three or four times over that 90 days. And then after that, it's just going to be check-ins on a semi-annual basis. And then the next year they get to go through that boot camp, so to speak, again. And and those are usually for the clients that are, you know, less than a hundred thousand in income really just starting out. A lot of them are, are young. They're and they're in their early, mid to early twenties, college grads, maybe just, you know, in nursing or something like that, where they don't have a lot of things going on. Uh, the next level. And how does that price? Uh, that price, the minimum price for that is $150 a month. The, the next level up then brings in some, some more subscription services. So that, that is where we will do some more work on like debt analysis, helping them dive into their student loans or come up with a debt elimination plan for maybe some credit cards or, or whatever they may have. It also will start to pull in other financial goals, saving for a home, saving, you know, understanding their retirement plans better, et cetera. And that will start at around 200 a month and will go up to, uh, I believe about 350 a month. From there, there's a, the and next just- Sorry, just really quickly, like, just how do you figure out who's a who's a two hundred dollar a month client in that tier and who's a three hundred dollar a month client in that tier? So it, a lot of it is based on the income that the person has and the the complexity of their situation. So if they're you know if they're just if it, they're single, no kids, you know maybe they don't own a home yet, they're just renting. More than likely, they're going to fall into that silver category, especially if they're making less than one hundred thousand dollars a year. They're in the, that twenty something percent tax bracket and lower. And, and it's a W-2 wage. Okay. So I'm not going to be having meetings with their CPAs and trying to strategize on tax planning and tell them you've got a W-2 wage, you know, just, yeah, if you want to use the CPA, go right ahead, but you can probably go to one of those uh, TurboTax or one of those situations and probably get the, a pretty similar result. So the next level up, it just, it, the complexity just evolves a bit. So we have folks that have dual income, have children, maybe they have a home, maybe one or both of their incomes include some 1099 style of income, or or maybe they're getting some sort of you know, royalties or, or other sources of income that just complicate their tax situation a bit and complicate, you know, the, or the way I describe it to clients is either you have consistent income or it's lumpy. And if you have lumpy income, you, it's kind of, it can be very difficult to budget at times because sometimes you have a lot of money and sometimes you don't. And so you have to find ways to structure your expenses. Like, for instance, I've had clients that are living paycheck to paycheck, but then they get these huge bonuses at the beginning of the year quarterly. And so I have a conversation. Why are you paying your auto insurance monthly? First of all, they charge you more for doing that. Let's just time your auto insurance around the same time you get that big bonus and just pay the annual. And it's like, it takes this huge load. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, well now I can save $150 a month into that Roth IRA you talk about. I'm like, yeah, you sure can. So that, that will graduate them up into the gold financial service. And that's where most of our clients are living in that, that 200 to $350 a month sort of space. And then as their situation gets more complicated, so the next level up, let's say if they have, you know, maybe some complicated estate planning issues, or they have, maybe it's a, you know, they're the owner or owner or partner inside of a business and they're trying to figure out how to build compensation plans inside of it, or they have the child that is going into college and they're trying to figure out how to finance that. So again, it, it, it and the income's a lot higher. So a lot of, so people in the next level that platinum, their, their, their household incomes are generally the 300 to $500,000 a year. 
And, and, and they, a lot of them will sign up for the monthly just because they have so much going on and they haven't spent a lot of time focusing on their finances. And, and they're, they're really aggressive about, about wanting to save and hit these financial goals because they know they have the means to do it. They just haven't been taught how. Because sometimes those monthly meetings aren't even with them. It's like, no, this meeting you can attend if you want, but I'm, you signed this form so I can talk freely to your CPA. This is going to be a powwow between me and your CPA. And, and then once the CPA gets on, like, okay, we're going to have this meeting quarterly. Okay. Because I don't understand why you keep filing extensions for this person. Oh, because they don't get the information, but they don't understand what it means to get you the information. So I have access to most of it. So let's you and I work together and let's get an on time filing. I was excited. This year we had five clients that filed on time for the first time in history, all because they were prepared. Because when the CPA sent the, the, the thing over, I just forwarded it to my system. I was like, hey, everything's in, the, in their tax folder. Just go ahead and put it in share file, send it over. Share file, another tool that I use um, with sharing of uh, confidential information securely. So we, I think we only have maybe two. We have two. I think we may, I think three, one, two. We have four. We have four clients that are in that diamond range. And those are clients, they typically, I don't, I don't think I have anyone that's in diamond that has paid the full fee, the full diamond level fee every single year. Um, the most recent one was a client who's, who his mother, who was a client passed away. He inherited millions and, you know, he was going from making his household, making a, a little under $150,000 a year to all of a sudden having distributions of 50, 60,000 a year from the IRAs and, you know, a house that needed to be sold and trying to figure out her pension plan and life insurance distributions and all that good stuff. And he was definitely, he understood. He was like, I, I know, I, he's like, I don't know what I'm doing. I know you helped my mom with all this stuff. I need you to, to, to just help me. So he was in that diamond category. Uh, I've got another client that is um, an executive in uh, a tech company and compensations over a million a year. And 80% of it is in the form of stock. So we're spending a lot of time when, when they're able to sell coming up with a strategy of how to sell it, you know, again, working with the CPA for tax planning. They're managing multiple multiple properties that, that we're, um, I'm helping with them with, with managing and seeing how that fits into their overall financial plan. So, so again, it's a, in the discovery session, I show my clients, look, this is the matrix of where your fee is going to fall based on your complexity. Here's where I think you are. I've never had a client argue me down saying, no, you said I'm gold. I think I'm silver, but I have had clients try to argue me up. And I'm not going to stop them. Like, hey, you know what? You're right. You should pay more for this. So let's do it. If you, well, you know, if you see value in the upper tier, I am not going to argue with your perception of my value. <laughs> I appreciate that you see my value. The thing, I think the thing that, that, that in the times I'm thinking of when that happens is because they'll see something that's included in that going from gold to platinum. And one of the things that I include in platinum is family financial planning, where I'll say, hey, bring in your parents who are, you know, maybe whatever their financial situation is, let, let's talk about how that affects you. Because that's another question that I ask is, do you now or will you in the future have to financially or physically care for your parents? And I ask that because I had to do it for mine, both, both financially and physically. My mother-in-law lives with us right now. And so I, I find that there's a, there's a lot of people in, I, I believe they call us the sandwich generation where we're caring for kids. I actually, my sandwiches, I got a, a hoagie going on here. I've got a child that just got out of diapers. I've got a child that's in college and I have a mother-in-law that's living with me that is disabled. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a hoagie. It's a hoagie. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so, so help me understand just how do the last two tiers price? You were like 150 a month for silver, 200 to 350 for gold. And then the, the platinum is, is, is between 400 and 600. And then on the diamond, it's, uh, it's 10,000 a year, essentially. So it's, was that eight, 800 a month or something like that? 833 a month, I believe it is. So the tiers for you is, I guess, uh, silver has maybe slightly fewer meetings because you do your like initial 90-day interval, but then they're into semi-annual check-ins. It sounds like for the rest of them, it's not necessarily a difference in like meeting cadence or how often they see you. It's more directly tied to the complexity of the stuff like, oh, you want me in with your affiliated professionals and talking to your parents as well? Well, you got to come up to platinum. We're not, we're not covering that in gold. Or, oh, we got to go to a whole other level of depth around you know, managing your inheritance and spending multiple meetings with your accountant and your attorney. Like that's diamond. Exactly. And, and what I'll do and what I'll do is after the, each new client gets that initial 90 days where it's just a lot of intense work where we're like, is it getting financially naked, connecting all of your accounts, setting all of that up so we can see everything and, and know more about the client financially. 
But once we get through that, I will in the gold and in the platinum, I will give the clients the choice of how often would you like to continue to meet? And I tell, and I tell my clients up front that the fee, the fee is, is quoted on an annual basis, but I give you permission to pay it monthly. I have a great tool called advice pay. You can set it up automatically. You can come out monthly or it can come out quarterly or it can do sim- we can do semi-annually. But again, of course, we have some compliance hurdles we have to get over with semi-annually. got to make sure I'm not taking more than I'm supposed to up front without getting delivery to service, et cetera. So I don't explain that to the client, but I will make sure I steer them into a place where I know that I can deliver the advice and deliver the financial planning and still stay, stay compliant. But I'll make sure that they understand that they're not paying to meet me on a monthly basis. I'm just giving them the choice to pay their fee monthly to make it easier. And I tell clients, cancel anytime. If you decide this service isn't giving you any more value, stop giving me money. Matter of fact, if you let, you can get, I've told silver clients, you can get through the full 90 days, have your plan, have the plan implemented and decide on month three that you don't want to pay me anymore. And Michael, it's happened twice out of a hundred and Let's see, since I've been using advice pay, I'd have to check my, I think we put 200, if not more clients through advice pay. And we've had two that have walked away right after they go through that initial 90 days. Now I've also had people that for financial, I mean, cause we went through COVID. I had clients, I had all sorts of clients in different walks of life through COVID that, you know, had income disruption and they just, they've said to me, Hey, can I pause the financial plan for a little while? I'm like, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Pause it. Well, I was going to ask, how have you found for retention of clients in the model and then retention of clients through through an environment like COVID where there were people getting paid off, losing their jobs when they're paying you from the income that comes in their bank account from their jobs. Yeah. No. So I, I found that, that those that found themselves in that situation where they lost a job, what have you, you know, when they, when we had the meeting and they told me that was going on, I was already mentally prepared to say, you know, if you need to, we can just pause this financial planning fee. And I had a few of them that said, you know, I don't need to pause it right now, but you know, if, if things get really tight, is that a big problem? I said, no, not a problem at all. I was like, well, what does that mean for meetings? And I'm like, you know, well, if you don't have the finances anyways, I think most of your time needs to be spent looking for a job. But if you have some offers and you want to hop in on a meeting to discuss those offers and discuss the benefits, by all means, let's do it. Because I'm looking at like, if they go back to work, they're going to just, they're going to start paying us again. It's that simple. And I, I haven't, let's say I'm trying to think, I think I can think of one instance where I had someone abusing my grace, if you will. But for the most part, they, people understand that, look, this is a fee for a service. Part of what you get from the service is, is access. If you want to set up that access where we're meeting every quarter, we can do that right now. If you want to set it up where you, th- you think we need to meet monthly, we can do that right now. Or I can here give you this link for every client. We, another service we use is called Rebrandly. And it's a way to create shortened links. It's, it's kind of like a bit.ly where you can create a shortened link for anything you want. So uh, my assistant for every new client will go into one sub, which is our scheduling system, and they'll create a unique link for that client where they can click that link at any time and have access to the calendar. And they don't have to put in their name, their phone number, their email address, because it's their unique link. All that stuff is already in there. And we send them that link and like, you know, I know you have quarterly meetings, but if you need to grab 15 minutes in our calendar, just this is your link, store it wherever you have my name stored in your phone, go to the notes and store this link in there. So you're not just making like a branded scheduling link for your firm. You're actually making like a firm branded scheduling link for every client. Exactly. And some of the, some of the, the worst things that have happened with giving out those links is a client will give it to a referral. <laughs> and then that referral is like, oh, I was trying to schedule a meeting, but it has somebody else's name. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's not, that's their link. That's not, which, you know, not, <laughs> so, not the, not the worst way for someone to get introduced. Like, wow, this advisor's got private links for individual clients. My advisor doesn't do that, right? Like if, if, if they're going to have an accident in, in kind of getting in your system, quote unquote, the, the wrong way, like good way for them to accidentally get introduced. To but it was awkward on that Zoom call. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> like the, you are not the person that owns this private link. <laughs> Hi, who are you? Exactly. So again, I think it goes back to, like, as you're saying, in looking at, at the service model, I wanted to create a model that promoted access because I, I'm a firm believer that part of the reason why so many people make so many financial mistakes is because they didn't have access to the information to make a better decision. So I want my clients to feel that they have access to me, even if that access means, I mean, right now, if you go to my calendar, you're probably not going to find anything to July because I'm taking a week off in June. 
but I made sure I communicated with clients like, Hey, I'm taking some time off in June. It may be hard to find me if you need a quick meeting, but if, if all else fails and you can't find 15 minutes, in my calendar, here's my assistant's name and number, you know, reach out to her. She'll find some time for you or just email and you say, Hey, it's urgent. I need to review that. I don't need a meeting. I just need to know what to do with this. No problem. I, it, if I can't help you answer that, then I have someone on my team that, that can. So, so I believe in when meeting the client that I want them to understand that I want to give them access, but I also want to have some structure. And that structure is going to be this first 90 days. We're going to meet about four or five times for the first 90 days. After that, we're going to select either a monthly or a quarterly. And I'll share with them, look, some people that do monthly, by the time they get to the seventh or eighth meeting, they're like, I don't need to do this monthly. And that's fine with me. I have no problem with that at all. That's, that's great. Let's switch to a quarterly. And also share with them that sometimes we get to those meetings and we'll spend more time in that meeting just talking about how our children will, are doing then we spend talking about, you know, actually drilling down your finances because a lot of things we have set up to where they don't need a lot of work because we did all of the work up front. From there, it's just me monitoring it. And we're having a meeting so that you can check in and make sure I'm actually monitoring. Is the business model at this point like only subscription fees? Are you also doing assets under management? Do you, do you help clients with investments if they got investment stuff? Or are you solely focusing in on budgeting and money scripts and all the conversations that tie to the subscription fees? I do offer asset management and I do offer asset management for a fee. I am acutely aware though of the writing on the wall for asset management. And I believe that fees will continue to get compressed. I mean, I'm just waiting. Uh, my my, my uh, custodian and Schwab, if you're listening, uh, stop listening at this point and pick back up in about five minutes. Schwab, I, I watched a Schwab went from charging me you know, 1995 on average per trade, if I decide to put a client in a wrap account to 1290 or 1495 to 12 to nine to $4 and 95 cents to zero. And in that, I was just thinking to myself, well, wait a minute, how they, they, they've got to be able to monetize on us somehow. So some way. So I, I'm, I feel like it's coming. It, eventually they're going to draw the line in the sand and say, everyone that has under this much assets, you know, this is what the cost is going to be to have access to the service or something. I feel like something is coming eventually for us as advisors that will further cause us to have to compress our fees or find different ways of, 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 um, of doing business. And so my maximum AUM fee is 1%. And the only people that pay 1% are the ones that have um, less than, than half a million dollars and I'm building custom portfolios for them, meaning they want to you know, pick their stocks or want my feedback on the stocks that they're picking, or they are at a fee that's less than 1% and can be as low as, as 40 bips, 40 basis points, because I'm using a subscription sort of model to a robo portfolio where I'm going out selecting the robo portfolios, I build it, and then you, know, you pick your level of risk and, and that's what you go into. And more and more clients are starting to go towards that. I actually had a, had a client, great guy, he's an engineer, and he wanted to do a, um, a test. He had two portfolios, an IRA and a non-qualified of about the same size. And he wanted to see how the robo portfolio perform as opposed to, which was a bunch of passive ETS, as opposed to the one where he and I were actively, you know, <laughs> giving it our, our best guess. After four years, the difference in return was less than half a percent. You don't want to know because it's going to make everyone go out and say, why am I doing this? It, yes, it was the robo portfolio one by half a percent and less risk over the entire. Now, that's only four years. The, the, the study continues. We haven't switched <laughs> totally. He, we talked about it. I was like, why are we still doing this? Like, oh, OK, well, there's more IPOs coming out this year. I want to pick up some of those. OK, fine. But we keep looking at that data like, ah, man, that robo portfolio is kicking our butts. So and and so what are you? What are you using to, to implement this? I mean, you're talking about robo portfolios, but you're running on Schwab. So is that like, are you using Schwab's institutional intelligent portfolios robo offering? Yep. I'm using Schwab's institutional intelligent portfolios and I'm using Riskalyze. So that, that is turning into a form of robo portfolios. So Riskalyze has their auto rebalancing feature. They have where they will link to Schwab. They'll see all of your accounts, your holdings, et cetera. You can pick from a suite of passively managed or actively managed portfolios, be it ETFs, mutual funds, Fidelity, BlackRock, First Trust. And they will give you signals to say, hey, you need to rebalance this portfolio because it's outside of the risk number that the client has selected or uh, BlackRock has decided to kick out this large cap fund and add this large cap fund. So it dramatically reduces the amount of work I have to do. I still have to go in and physically trade though. 
Um, so, so it hasn't quite removed me completely like the institutional intelligence portfolios has. But the even an institution, institutional international portfolio, excuse me, IIP, because I can't say it <laughs> 10 times fast, we only have to build it once, but it won't pull the feedback. So if I duplicate BlackRock's portfolio in IIP, if BlackRock changes, I still have to go in and physically change it in IIP. They haven't those things don't talk to each other yet. So it's still a little bit of work, but it's less work than a, just a custom portfolio where, you know, the client is picking 10 different stocks and then I'm trying to add some ETFs or some funds in there to balance it out, that sort of thing. So, um, so yeah, I recently started adding some portfolios or some clients to Altruist, which is, I call it the advisor's answer to Betterment. And I know Betterment starting to build some advisor platforms, at least I think I read that recently. But Altruist is a, a very clean interface, very easy for clients to understand and use. I think it works phenomenally, especially with your smaller clients where you're just trying to do a, a Roth IRA or you know just a small investment account. And it is a robo-like portfolio. You build, they have some that you can subscribe to or you build yours yourself and the client's money goes in. You don't have to trade a, trade a thing. It gets assigned to a portfolio. It rebalances on its own. And you get to be hands off. Um, so I just started adding that in April. So far, I love it, and it is provided. Schwab, Charles Schwab can be a little intimidating, especially I've, I've found with the client that doesn't have a lot of financial knowledge. You know, when you get on the Schwab app, there's just so many places to click and so many buttons, and and it's, it's just it's a lot. Whereas Altruist, it's a really clean, simplified platform. And the feedback I've gotten from the clients that are starting to use it is they love it. I mean, I have one client that was on Schwab and then I set up an account on Altruist and I said, why are you even, why am I at Schwab? I was like, I get it. But some people like having access to all those other bells and whistles and she did not. So she, she loves the Altruist platform. So, so I'm just curious, like as you are now, you're building model portfolios with Schwab's institutional intelligence, you're building model portfolios and like riskalyzes marketplace of models, you're building some models on altruist. Do you have a, I guess, just like a, a sense or an expectation? Like where, where do you expect to keep using all three? Cause it's like different clients get things from different platforms. Do you envision ultimately like one's going to get stamped the winner and that's the one you're going to end out working with and focusing on? So it is, they are the same portfolios on all of them. And, and I have to say at this point, I don't, do the manual labor of building them. I do the labor of deciding, okay, here's what's going to be on it. And then I have a team member that goes and does all the manual labor of putting everything in. And I just, you know, check to make sure what he's put in is, is correct and what we want the clients to experience. The what I've learned is that the the riskalyze platform gives me a unified place to assess and understand how my client interprets interprets risk. And Schwab doesn't do that and Altruist doesn't do that. So there will always be a riskalyze or something like it, I believe, as a part of my practice so that I know that the client understands the level of risk that they're willing to take inside their portfolio. So, so think, I think of riskalyze almost as a, as a, it's, it's a tool that is necessary no matter where I think I'm going to have my client's assets housed. So does that mean you're by default starting to anchor that? then I'm just going to end out living all of it in their skies because I got to be there anyways. Or, hey, I still like the portfolio management stuff of other things better. As long as risk allies keeps integrating, I'm happy. As, exactly. As long as risk allies keeps integrating, which I've been, Altruist just got like $50 million in a Series B funding or A, I don't remember what letter, but they got $50 million. And my first question that I was sending out to them was, when are you going to integrate with eMoney and risk allies? That, that's all I need you to integrate there because right now it, it is a little cumbersome because if I have a client going to Altruist, that information won't feed back to Riskalyze. But I still send them the Riskalyze to determine their risk level so I can pick the portfolio for them. But those two aren't talking to each other. So yes, Riskalyze right now will continue to be my risk management hub. So I can at least document that I've had the conversation with the client, that they understand the level of risk they're taking. Because the last thing I want, I've, I've been 20 plus years and, and have never had a client complain about their returns or lack thereof. And that's because I, I'd spend a lot of time with clients helping them understand what risk and loss tolerance really is. And, and like I said, risk is my, is my tool to do that. And then what platform or what custodian that they end up on? I mean, actually, let's rewind. With Riskalyze, I have clients where I don't manage any of their money yet because it's all sitting inside their 401k, but I'll still have them link that to Riskalyze so that I can do, so they can take the risk analysis and then I can tell them, hey, 
based on what you just said on your risk, your portfolio doesn't match that. Um, so let's make some changes in the portfolio and risk allies will continue to track that because they connected their 401k to e-money and e-money is automatically connected to risk allies on my side. So, so yeah, so risk allies is, is, is yes, it is a portfolio management tool, but it is, it is that risk assessment tool first. And that's what it will, will always serve as for me. And, but it, the added bonus is that I can overlay it on Schwab and it'll tell me what trades need to happen to keep that client inside of that risk profile. So for the business overall now, like how, how many clients are under the money script wealth management umbrella? I believe the count is about 225. And, and that is, that is after a tremendous amount of growth. Last year, we had our biggest year ever of client acquisition. We got 53 new clients. And that's, I, I've never had over 50 new clients in a year. My best year ever was my first year in the business. I got 40. So last year we got 53 new clients and this year we were at 32 year to date. So it is growing fast. We just, I think that if it didn't go live today, it will go live in the next day or so. We are looking for another licensed advisor to come onto the team. My analyst is scheduled to get his insurance license this summer and his series 65 uh, in the fall. And so the goal is by the end of the year that we have a three advisor platform so that I can really start to, to divide up more of, of the work. And the biggest thing that I want to get off my plate as soon as possible is all this stuff we just talked about with Riskalyze and, and, and Altruist and Schwab. I, I've got to get out of the business of, of actually trading the accounts. That, that is something that, that needs to happen, will have to happen this year or else we won't be able to keep growing. And what does the business look like? If I can ask from the the revenue end and like the revenue mix end, I mean, in practice across 225 clients, like how much how much revenue is subscription fees? How much revenue is AUM fees? How much revenue is is insurance business? Like, how does this end up monetizing in practice for you? Subscription fees is growing the fastest. It's currently about 40 percent of the revenue. That is the, the, the fastest grower currently. Another 30% of the revenue is the asset management fees. And then the remaining 20% is an in insurance. I think I did my numbers right there. And, and what's insurance business for, for you guys? I mean, is, is this term insurance? Is this, are you like also in a disability insurance realm? Because I know that's popular for working with a lot of doctors. That's the number one. The number one is disability insurance by far. And then behind that as a, as a close second will be term insurance. We are believers in a larger death benefit, even though the, the time period may be a bit shorter, but early on in your career, a larger death benefit is going to, we feel, serve a greater purpose than, than the permanent insurance. And not the bang on permanent insurance out there, but I spent years as a as an expert witness for when our company was being challenged by a client, this is in my previous firm, not at, not at Money Script, but when we were being challenged by a client for um, things that maybe the advisor did, did not do properly in the insurance world. And more often than not, it was for a permanent insurance policy that was underfunded almost every single time. That's what it was about. And, um, and, I, and I saw some really, really sad stories. And so it changed my philosophy uh, around permanent insurance. And I just, I firmly believe it is for a client that's already checked all the, all, all the other boxes. You've already maxed out your 401k. You've already maxed out your, your Roth IRA or backdoor, or whatever it is. You know, you're putting the 15,000 a year into 529. You have some term insurance and you're still looking for a place to put some money. Okay. Let's talk about this permanent life insurance policy and how to maximum fund it so that it doesn't collapse on you later. So we probably, and this is in total contrast from earlier in my career where I would do, you know, anywhere between 15 to 20 permanent contracts a year. Now, maybe we do three to five. But every time we do one, it's max funding every single time. So, yeah, you, you know, you're signing up to put 15, 20, 30,000 dollars a year into this policy. And, and how are you doing the insurance business in practice? Like, are, are you operating as RIA and broker dealer or are you sort of RIA and standalone insurance agent, but not BD licensed? Just how does that work in practice? Yeah, not BD licensed. So any insurance products that we do are, are underneath our, they're fixed insurance products. I have researched and looked into a few of the variable that will now fit under the um, Series 65 and insurance license RIA holder, but I haven't done any of it in practice. So we, it's, it's fixed and it's index, universal life, universal life and whole life. So it's, it's uh, RIA. And then I'm also an insurance agent, which of course I disclose everywhere. So, so I let clients know that's what it is. And I tell them, actually, I'm going to pass you off to, to my wife. She's going to, she's going to help you get through the process because I'm going to focus on your financial plan and helping you on your asset management. And just, do you end out contracting appointed directly with the companies? Is there like a, 
support platform or intermediary intermediary that you work with on the insurance side of the business? Yes, there is. So I, I work with Crump Insurance Services. So they are an insurance hub, if you will, or a broker of insurance, and they can uh, they assist with getting appointed with different insurance companies. So I think collectively between myself and my two agents, we are appointed with about 20 different insurance companies, everyone from John Hancock to Lincoln to AIG to Banner to you keep just keep naming them and their their principal and we do have a direct relationship with guardian and that is specifically for their disability products we don't do a lot of life products with them but guardian is a very very big competitor in the um physician space when it comes to insurance products and we have a direct relationship with mass mutual so guardian and mass mutual will compete really hard to get the the those uh physician contracts that are in the best interest of of the physician so we do we are contracted with them directly so then help me understand just where the heck do 53 new clients come from plus 32 more year to date. And as, as of when we're recording, we are not even halfway through the year yet. So like, just where are all these clients coming from? That is a lot of client flow. So, uh, so going back to my, when I started my career, so I was living in Charlotte, North Carolina, working for Nations Bank. Nations Bank merged with Bank of America. I was doing great as a teller, personal banker. And then I got introduced, and this is in the late 90s, I got introduced to mutual fund investing. I was like, oh, wow, this is where it's at. Of course, that's where it was at. It was 1999. And I wanted to be a broker. And so my, my branch manager wrote a letter for me. And even though I didn't have a college degree, it got me into the uh, broker training program. Well, that was shortly after the merger. So they decided to shut that program. The, the Na- Nation's Bank, Bank of America. Yes, the Nation's Bank, Bank of America merger. So that program got shut down. And unfortunately, shut it down didn't tell us. <laughs> we showed up for work and all of our ID badges wouldn't let us in the building. Oh, that's really spectacularly awkward. Yeah. So from there, I, I was looking to get into financial services. Um, and I also had a, another competing thing happening. I had a, had a child on the way. And so I'm looking to get in financial services. Now, I had a mentor at the time that worked for New York Life. And, but he, and he was trying to get me to go to New York Life, but I, I just, I, I didn't really understand the insurance world at that time. And I was just focused on brokerage services, brokerage for services. And so I, I eventually um, was able to get a couple of interviews and I was at the interview with Merrill Lynch that I got turned down for, for not having a college degree and lack of you know experience. And he said, if you want to you know get started in this business, go to American Express. And I was like, the credit card company? How, how does that work? And so did some research, found an American Express branch in Charlotte, North Carolina, went and interviewed with them. And they said, no, no college degree, no experience. You don't even have a natural market. It was one of, they asked me in, in the interview, which was awkward for me about the wealth that my family has. And I had to tell them, but none. Grew up in the hood around the corner. I don't know. I don't, I, no, uh, there's no wealth there. So, so I, I walked out of that interview just really disappointed. But as I kept looking for jobs, I saw the article in the paper for American Express. And it said, you know, college degree preferred, not required. And I was like, oh, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So I called up American Express corporate office in Minneapolis and told him about my experience. And I said, oh, well, we have these new employee platform programs happening in Boston, Dallas, and San Francisco. And so I said, Boston's too cold. San Francisco is too expensive. We packed our bags and I, I drove to the interview in Dallas. We put everything in storage, put some things in the car. We drove to Dallas. It, uh, my son's mother happened, her godmother happened to live in Dallas. And so it kind of worked out. So here we are in Dallas. I go to the interview, didn't know it was going to be a, a cattle call type interview. So I'm in there, you know, standing room only, 30 people in there. They give the presentation. They gave this little aptitude, you know, personality test, which apparently I, I did well on. So they invited me back to another interview. In that, that interview, uh, it, it went well, ultimately. Frank Judge, Frank, if you're listening, thank you. So Frank it, did my interview. He liked me. He passed me on to the FVP. The FVP also liked me, and he offered me a job the day before I turned 20, 21 years old. Uh, he said, all right, the job starts. He, well, he gave me a choice. He said, you can either pay for your licensing on your own, or you can become an employee, but if you fail a test, you're fired. And so I was like, I will take the employee route. I'm currently popping popcorn in a movie theater. So yes, I will, I will take that employee route happily. And as an employee, we spent um, about six hours a day studying, but the other two hours was, was about marketing, developing your natural market. And one of the first things they put in my hands was a referral script. And I remember Frank telling me, memorize this referral script. Your career depends on it. And I took it to heart. And I memorized that referral script and I would practice that referral script on anybody that was willing to listen. There was a young lady 
that worked in the floor below us. And she worked for a company called Heart Place Associates. And she was cute and she knew it. And I was a handsome young man myself. And so I was flirting a little bit. I admit it. I was. But I also was thinking to myself, you know what? She probably knows a lot of doctors because she works for this company that provides medical devices for, for cardiologists. And so I asked her to lunch many, many times. I really just wanted to, to give her the uh, practice my referral script. And of course, she said, I have a boyfriend. And I said, I have a baby on the way. So, I mean, we can bring our significant others. That, that's what you want. But, you know, I, I'd really like to, to, you know, talk with you a little bit about this career that I'm starting. And so finally, she relented. She said, okay, fine. We went to Baja Fresh. We had lunch. And she's sitting there. And I, I'm, we're at the end of lunch. And I, I'm starting to present my referral script. And she said, look, I've been working here for like four years. I see all the advisors that come here. I know what you want. You want my list of doctors. And she reaches into her bag and she pulls out a Rolodex, old fashioned 2001. So she has Rolodex with all her business cards. Well, I wasn't going to say I did, but yes, actually I do. And so when now, you got there. <laughs> now, Frank had also taught me something else very important. He said, you don't want a list of names. He said, that's like me handing you the phone book and say, hey, there's probably some clients under the letter R. Why don't you call them? And he's like, that's cold calling. So you don't want to list. You want to get referred to people that they have a, a relationship with that they're willing to introduce you to. So even though she gave me that list, I did not let my pride get the best of me. I still did my entire referral script, pen in hand, piece of paper. And I asked her, I said, thank you for these doctors. But because, again, I had a, a baby on the way, we spent a lot of time going to see an OBGYN. And that dawned on me. And I was like, oh, well, that's probably a referral that I could probably get from every woman is a referral to their OBGYN because most females have an OBGYN. And so I said, thank you for all these cardiologists. I'd like to get to know some other doctors that you may know. She's like, I don't know any other doctor. I was like, of course you do. I said, how about your OBGYN? And she said, oh, so-and-so. And she called her by her first name. So that was the first thing I was like, that was weird. She was like, oh yeah, her and my, my, her, uh, she and my mom went to college together. As a matter of fact, you might want to reach out to her because um, I heard she's trying to start her own practice. And she gave me that OBGYN's phone number. Those 85 cardiologists, not one of them ever took my call. But that OBGYN, I called her over and over and over again, got to know her gatekeeper who still works with her today, Tiffany. And one day I said to Tiffany, I said, Tiffany, how do I get the doctor on the phone? Every time I call, I always get to you. She's like, well, she's with patients. What do you, I mean, she's a doctor. And I said, well, she's got to have a time where she actually takes phone calls. And she says, oh yeah, Thursday mornings between seven and nine. She's like the only one here. It was a Wednesday when that happened. I wrote down the doctor's phone number on the back of my, one of my business cards, put it in my shirt pocket, took it home that night. Thursday morning, I'm brushing my teeth and I'm like, oh, I pull out my Palm Pilot, really dating myself. And I'm like, let me call this doctor's office real quick. Toothpaste in mouth and toothbrush. I call, she picks up on the first ring and she says, oh yeah, I know you've been trying to get in touch with me and I really do need to come and sit down with you. Are you available tomorrow? Now, this is nowhere in my phone script. I don't even know how to react to this. I said, yeah, sure, sure. Tomorrow. Yeah. What time? And she tells me the time. Of course, I'm skipping to the office that day and I'm telling, you know, my leaders, hey, guess what? I got this doctor. She wants to come in tomorrow. And they're like, uh, that's in the middle of phone clinic. You got to reschedule. I'm not rescheduling her. Well, you can't miss phone clinic. I, I, I'll take the risk. So I found another advisor in the office that joined me for that meeting and she signed up. That young lady or that doctor, she's actually retiring next year. It was from her that 70% of our clients today came from that relationship. She referred me to a friend of hers that was a podiatrist. That podiatrist referred me to an ER doctor. That ER doctor was probably the most instrumental because she got me into a, diff some, a few different residency programs because she was in a very horrible financial situation. I helped her through all of it. She also went through breast cancer. I helped her through that as well. So she sings my praises everywhere we go. So, so it wasn't necessarily that like literally one client referred this giant slew of clients, but that one client sort of created the branching network of all the different referrers over time that have driven the growth. Yes, 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 yes. And that one client gave me the opportunity to say, if history repeats itself, and by the way, that's how I met you, somewhere through this process, you're going to see an opportunity to introduce me to one of your friends or family members so that they can learn how to do whatever it is that funny, whatever hot financial topic it is going on at that time for them. And that's what I present to every single client. And, it, and the, the way what happened last year that was able to drive our growth is that my, my wife and her infinite wisdom trying to help scale and take things off my plate. She said to me, she said, yo, why, 
why are you asking for referrals in the client meeting? Why don't you just send an email? I was like, that's too impersonal. I'm not going to send an email. She was like, no, it's, it's not impersonal. She was like, if you tell them, hey, I'm going to, you know, you say whatever it is that you say. And she rolled her eyes as she uh, gave that comment. And then just follow up with an email. And then I'm, I'm looking at her and we're having this moment like, don't try to tell me how to run my financial planning practice. I've been doing this for years. I've got a referral based practice and I'm, you know, standing really tall. And she said, I'll just build the email and I'll, I'll just do it. And I said, fine, whatever. And that's what she did. So we have inside of, so in Wealthbox, you can build uh, workflows in Wealthbox. So we, every, so we have a um, new financial planning client workflow. So what she did is she inserted into the workflow right after their third meeting, after their third meeting, she put in a, a workflow step for my assistant. So I don't even do it. And the workflow step, it just says, hey, I know you're enjoying your, your process of financial planning and you're learning a lot thus far and you're starting to take action on your financial goals. As you'll mention to you, and as you probably know, because you were probably referred to us, this is something like that. I have to read it word for word, but we work on a referral basis. We'd love to take opportunity to be introduced to a couple of one or two people that you think that can benefit. All we ask you to do is to send them an email and copy us on it. Michael, the emails just started pouring in because that meeting that we call a strategy session, I probably do about 10 of them a week. So all of a sudden, 10 emails are going out every single week asking people for referrals. Now, couple that with what's going on with, with, with COVID last year and people really looking close as, uh, closely at their finances. Right. Lots just, of people last year saying like, oh, I got to get my finance stuff figured out. Oh, funny thing. I just started working with Johans and he's really good. You should talk to him. Like, boom, I'll, I'll send you an email. We'll, I'll introduce you. I have clients writing dissertations almost on these emails. I mean, categorize, categorizing all of the things that we've done together, how the meetings make them feel, why they think they need to do this here. Hey, I've copied him on the email. I'm sure you guys will take it from there. And, and then I'll see the email chain. Oh man, that's exactly what I need. And they'll, they'll tell the story about, and, and this is in mind, I'm just copied on the email. So they're just talking to each other. Right. right, right. Email. You just happen to get to like, listen and watch the conversation. Exactly. And then I see the emails like, Hey, I scheduled my appointment. And then the clients, I'm like, and clients calling me, hey, I got so and so scheduled appointment. I was like, I, I know, I'm copied on the email. Like, th- I mean, thank you, absolutely. But it, it's, it's funny how it just happened. I'm just copied on the email. So, and I never believed that would work. I did not. I, I completely thought it was not possible. But what I've learned is it's because we have a process and clients are going through this workflow where they're, you know, we're checking off all these boxes and they're doing their discovery session. They're doing their data session. They do their strategy session. Then they're doing their action session. And then we're scheduling their quarterlies or their monthlies after that. And clients love that process. And it's really easy for them to insert people in it because they can tell people exactly what to expect. And so that, that is what led to the majority of the growth last year. There was also an organization that I'm a part of called the American, American College of Emergency Physicians. So they have a they have a, an event uh, once a year where almost ten thousand uh, dollars ten thousand physicians excuse me it did cost ten thousand dollars too but ten thousand physicians uh, from all over the world come together for a group session and I would get a booth at this session and 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 having a booth was was always hit or miss I mean yeah we get some names we meet some people and I was able to pluck a few good clients out of there but once those clients got into the practice and went through the process then they just got that referral question. And then they started referring. And one of the individuals I met at the conference was the director of the diversity and inclusion program inside of ASAP. And so as a black man, I said, hey, where do I sign up? Let, let's do this. I want to support. I want to be a part of this. And they led me to a residency group that they work with. And so I started doing some Zoom calls for the residency group. Next thing I know, here's clients coming out of that residency group, you know, one by one. So so it, it really just just last year was a me having a huge value in having a referral process and being consistent about talking about referrals and telling clients that's how we build the practice, being okay with trying something new and asking via email and see what happens. And so implementing that as a process. So now, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of clients that just ignore that email. Okay. But I don't need everyone to read it. I don't. And, and just curious, like why, like, why did you put the email where where you did right like you could you could do this after the first meeting you could do it after the first year as an anniversary thing like why after the third meeting like why why was that the trigger point so now now you sound like like my wife Alicia so she asked the same question cuz she wanted to put it after the first meeting and i said absolutely not 
And my justification behind that was in the first meeting, it was, it, it's, it's them just really kind of bearing their all and opening up to us and them not really getting a lot from us just yet. Cause they're just telling us all the things they want and like, okay, well I can help you. It's by the time they have connected all their accounts and we get in that strategy session, that's where I'm actually starting to educate them and ask them questions like, why did you do that? Or why are you doing, or, and I'm asking the question of, okay, so let's point out, you told me what your values were, what's important to you. You told me what your goals were, what you want to accomplish, but now I'm looking at all your financial behaviors and they don't match. How do we get your financial behaviors in alignment? And we start having that hard conversation with them about their, their actual, what's actually happening. That's why I tell them like, look, the numbers don't lie. You know, if you're spending $1,800 a month dining out, I'm going to see it. I'm not going to judge you for it. I'm just going to ask you, well, but you said you want to be able to retire when you're 60. And right now, based on the, your savings rates, you won't be able to retire by your 60. You'll be able to retire by the time you're 82. So what gives here? How important is, is buying everybody's drinks at the bar? So it, it, it's in that strategy meeting that we're actually putting, for lack of a better metaphor, the rubber to the road on here are some of the changes you need to make. And, and client, I've had clients after their first strategy meeting where they will send me an email and say, man, that was heavy. Like, oh, I, like I feel so liberated. I'm, I'm, I'm already thinking about my finances different. Or I'll have clients say, you know what? I canceled Netflix and Hulu. I just did. I mean, I can always get them back, but let me see what it's like being without them for 90 days and see how I feel. So I, I feel like there, there's a lot of emotional touch points in that session with connecting the dots, rubber to the road sort of thing that happened in that session. So it becomes what, what we used to call, what I was told when I was in training I mean, 20 years ago, is you're looking for those referable moments where, where you see that the client just connected the dots they did it or the client, like one thing will happen in a strategy session, I'll look and say, like, wait, you're not putting money in your 401k? Why not? Huh? Or, or you're only putting 3%, they're matching four. What's up? 1% is not going to hurt. Look, listen, look, we're on Zoom. Just log in. Log into your 401k. Change them three to four. I, I doubt it's going to, you know, change your ability to pay your rent or pay your mortgage next month. You know what? You're right. And there's going to change. So that becomes more like, look, you did something. Let me show you what, and I can go right into e-money and say, let me show you what that does to your retire by 60 versus 82. Guess what? Just that 1% change it to 79. It may not seem like much, but that's, that's three years. That's a lot. That's significant. What if we went up to 10? Don't do it now. Let's finish the analysis and we'll, we'll kind of come back to it. So, so it becomes one of those referable moments. And, and we just want to make sure that we are capitalizing on that. So what surprised you the most as you've gone the journey of building your advisory business? What surprised me the most is really understanding that I can't do this alone, that, that I need support, that if I really want to scale and I really want to grow, that I'm going to have to hire a team of people. When, when, when Money Script Well started, it was, it was just me and Alicia doing some part-time was my wife, Alicia, doing some part-time filing for me, essentially. That's really all she was doing. And then it grew to myself, Alicia, and my youngest sister, Saida. And then it grew to an account specialist. And, and I had a few interns along the way. And, and now it's a team of six. So, so what has surprised me the most is how much more the firm is capable of when while I'm on a podcast with you in the middle of the afternoon, there's people's financial plans are being solved right now by my analysts. You know, Roth IRAs and 529s are being opened by my account specialist. My marketing specialist is is making updates to our website as we speak. So it it, it turns into it, it, where it's not just me that's doing these things because now my clients associate Alexis, who all Alexis, she doesn't make, she's not a licensed advisor. She's not making recommendations, but she's sending them the paperwork to open their 529. And when something's not right with it, she's calling them and saying, hey, you know, you you didn't put your kid's social security number on there. I need to get that. And so to them, to them now, it's like, oh, Alexis helped me open my 529. And I'm kind of looking at like, well, I, I mean, yeah, she did. But I made that recommendation. I taught you what a 529 is. But now they have this affinity to Alexis. Oh, she's so helpful. She helped me. We got money in the 529. I can't wait to, you know, share that with someone else, that sort of thing. So what surprised me more than anything for just, and this is just me as being a solo practitioner is, is how, how, how much greater our impact can be when it was more than just me. Because I started off as someone, I, I got out of a bad relationship when I left my uh, corporate job. I had a partner that things didn't work out with. And, um, and I told myself I'd <laughs> never have a team again. I didn't want it. I was in management for a decade and I, I, 
I, I was uh, running away from management when I when I left and didn't want to be in management, didn't want to have advisors. Now, as you heard me say earlier, we plan to have two more advisors on the team by the end of the year. So so that that is what has surprised me the most is how when I realized that I can be the captain of my own ship, how I can really create an atmosphere and a tone and a in a an environment for people to thrive and to improve their own financial lives as well, that that we can have a greater impact. And that's really what I wanted. That's why I got into financial services in the beginning, because I was looking at what the, the the financial situation that my parents were in. I was like, hey, how did this happen? How did you not have disability insurance when your company offers it? I don't understand. Oh, you declined it? Why? Why why are both of my parents dying without life insurance? I, how does that happen? Because you didn't understand how it worked. Okay, got it. So how do I change that? How do I pay that forward? And the best way I can do it is by having a lot of people that believe in it the same way I do and want to see that success created in other people's lives. And, and it, it really shocked me to find out that, that I, I cannot and will not do it alone. So what was the low point for you on the, on this journey? The lowest point for me on this journey was being fired from Ameriprise financial. So the company American express turned into Ameriprise uh, in 2007 uh, well, actually being fired twice um, in 2007. And in 2007, by then I was in California and I was a district manager, was was making great money, more money I'd ever seen before in my life. I think that's, I may have met you after that, but uh, uh, I was starting to get involved with the FPA. That's the thing I, I, I first met you was with the FPA on, on, a, on, on a panel there at some point. Um, but just, just, just doing just some amazing, I'm helping my parents financially. I'm helping my sisters. I mean, I'm feeling really good about life. And then the financial crisis hit. Simultaneously, I was divorcing my son's mother, which was not going well. It was costing lots of money. And, and I was in situations I really just didn't understand what I was doing. I made a bet in 2008 that when I when we separated the assets and I gave her the money that she wanted and and paid the attorneys and all those stuff, I, I said, oh, I'll be fine. I'll just pay the taxes on all these stock options that I cashed in in 2009. No problem. It'll be easy. Well, then the bottom fell out of everything. And guess what? They eliminated the district manager position and there was no stock option bonus that year where normally I would get about six figures that did not happen. And I ended up with a very large tax bill and didn't have the money for it. And so that was the first time I got fired. They eliminated the manager position. But fortunately, uh, I can't remember how many. There was a few hundred of us across the country and they all the positions got eliminated and less than 10 percent of us stayed with the company after that happened because most of us didn't have a practice anymore where i had still held on to my original hundred or so clients that i got in my first few years in the business oh because so many moved moved from production into into management let go of their clients and so when the management positions got downsized like they didn't have clients. Exactly. <laughs> not only did they not have clients, they didn't have jobs. There was nothing. There was, there, was, there was nothing. So I still had clients. So I was okay. All I had to do was go find a cubicle. Literally. They were like, I was like, wait, I'm losing my office too. That's ridiculous. They're like, well, your production isn't high enough to keep your office. I was like, fine, I'll go to the cubicles, but keep that office open for me. And then fast forward a couple of years later, I became a, I took my series 24 and because they changed the management structure, I was able to become a, a branch manager in Long Beach. And, and that's where I was spending the latter years of my career with Ameriprise. At the time, my son was getting a little bit older. Right now, he's a teenager, and he had spent his his from his uh, younger years. He had been in the theater, and he was really good at it. And he had finally got to the point where he had landed a principal role in Beauty and the Beast, and he was playing Lumiere. And after singing classes and coaching and and all of these nights and nights of you know rehearsals, it's opening night, and. For anyone that's been in corporate America, especially in financial services, um, you probably experience a point in time where you have your levels of management that are above you that are changing sometimes maybe too often. And I've been in a position where I'm in, a, in one of the top branches in the country. We're doing well, but the management above me had changed at least three or four times in a two year period where I kept going through these different either complex directors above me or regional leaders above me. And everybody comes in with their plan of how they're going to save the world. Well, I was still in one of the best offices. So I kind of had this, you know, this air about me like, okay, great. You're the new guy. That's awesome. What we're doing is working. I'll listen to what you have to say, but I'm not going to rearrange my whole life and do everything differently because you're trying to save the whole region. And maybe that was pompous of me, but that's how I felt about it. Well, this, this new leader that had come in, him, him and I did not get along at all. And there was a, a trip that he wanted me to go on. We were going to Arizona to help them learn how to do the recruiting that Southern California was doing. And he really liked, because I was, I started applying the same referral process and financial and, and the clients to recruiting. 
and it was working. And it's like, I really want you to go and teach this and also teach some of the things you're doing with the advisors on how to convert their practices to financial planning. Because, you know, we were at Ameriprise, we were trying to grab all the brokers that were not doing financial planning and bring them to the dark side. And this is in a public setting. And I, I, he said, OK, so we're going to go to Arizona and it's going to be Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And we'll like we'll do golf or something on Saturday. I said, sounds great. And I said, but I can't be there on Thursday because that's the opening night of my son's play. And he was like, well, aren't there like multiple nights of the play? I was like, yeah, there is. But Thursday's opening night and I'm going to be there. And he said, no, I need you to be in Arizona. And I said, no, I'm, I'll, I'll be there on Friday, but I'm not going to be there on Thursday. And he said, can we talk about it offline? I was like, there's nothing to talk about. And this was, again, this was in a group setting. And so that exchange happened. And this was probably two months before the event was happening, what have you. And, uh, and my assistant ended up purchasing my flight for that Thursday. And when I got the confirmation, I was like, oh, mm -mm, no, 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 no. I, I told him I'm not coming on Thursday. Change it to Friday. And so she did. And she got a lot of flack for it. And so did I. And. I remember having a conversation with him on Friday when we were there and he's, you know, uh, we were standing at a bar and he just, he was, you know, kind of telling me about myself. And I said, look, I was like, you don't get it. You don't have kids. I was like, so I don't expect you to get it. Okay. I was like, I've been through a divorce. I just, uh, that happened to be my weekend with my son. This is opening night. I'm not with him right now because I'm here with you guys, but I don't expect you to get that. Um, and I knew right in that moment that that was the beginning of the end. So fast forward about two months later, I had uh, saved up a bunch of my vacation and PTO time and decided to take three weeks off in the summer. And my wife and I were going to Orlando to see my brother, Chicago. We happened to have like a free trip to Chicago or somewhere, a hotel stay in Chicago or something like that. And then we were going to come back to Southern California. And I was on the plane and my complex director is calling my phone. And I don't answer the first time. And he sends me a text. I need you to answer the phone. So I answer the phone. I'm like, hey, man, I'm sitting on the plane. He's like, I, I know. And I know it's about to take off. I'll be brief. I want to let you know that your services with Ameriprise Financial have been terminated effective immediately. Know that you're not in town right now. We're going to pack up your stuff and we're just going to send it to your house. And I have HR here if you have any questions for them. And I, I cried. I cried. And, and going from being 20 years old in that final interview the day before I turned 21, being offered this awesome opportunity with no college degree, a young black man coming from the hood, you know, no natural market, but they're saying, hey, we're going to give you a chance. And then they gave me all the opportunities I need. I mean, I had meetings from, with the, the president of the company and all these other folks all over those years and how they were really saying, hey, as a young black man in this industry, we really like that you're here. And I got awards for hiring diversity candidates and like, how do you hire so many diversity candidates? I was like, start by being diverse. And that was my speech to everyone. I was like, that, sorry, I wish I could offer you more. I did hire more diverse people and then put those people in charge of hiring. That's how you get more diverse candidates. But to then just be let go. And the, their official reason was violation of the company travel policy. And it was the biggest punch in the gut. And then, and then the guy that fired me, the regional director, two months later, he packs up and goes to mass mutual. So I was distraught. Oh, and, and Michael, it was, I didn't get back into the, it took nine months for me to get back on the saddle because I was, I was thinking, rethinking everything. Mind you, I still had clients calling me because I, I had a partnership. I had one of the largest books in the office and I had a partner that I had taken on before I became a manager, a branch manager. And he, because we've been together for more than two years, he inherited my entire practice. So he went from generating about 200,000 a year in production to about 700,000 a year in production overnight. But all of my clients were still calling me and I'm like, sorry, I'm, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not, in, I'm not at a firm right now. And they're like, well, where are you going to be? Are you, are you going to Merrill? Are you going to Wells? You're going to, I, was like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And that was a really low point for me. It took a lot of soul searching, a lot of conversation with my wife, a lot of therapy to figure out because I'd, I'd never been fired before. And so, and so that, that was the lowest point for me. But then once I, I still remember to this day, it was, it was a Tuesday morning and we woke up and we're still in our <laughs> downtown living in Long Beach. And I remember staring out the window and just watching the palm tree sway. And my wife woke up and she asked what's wrong. And I was like, I, I don't have a job. The bank account's running low. I, I just don't know, don't know what I want to do. You know, I have some, some offers, but they're not really exciting. And, and she just said, what are you scared of? And, and she may have asked me that question before, but for some reason it's, that's, the, that's the day at, well, I, I know why I remember it because I know what I did next. But she was referring to, what are you afraid of, of starting your own firm? And on that day, on that Tuesday, I just looked at her and I said, I actually don't know. 
And she kind of got up and walked off to go, you know, make her morning tea or what have you. And I picked up my cell phone and I called a gentleman who I had been recruiting for years that was a, a RIA. And I said, I think I'm ready. And he said, I've been waiting on this phone call. Meet me for lunch. And the rest is here. So I, I didn't, the money, money script wealth didn't start then because I didn't have a practice. So I couldn't like just go to Schwab or go to TDA Ameritrade and say, hey, will you be my custodian? I have zero clients. So I wind up piggybacking off of another friend of his that had a practice. And he let me set up shop with him, team up under his RIA uh, until I got, actually, I didn't even get the full 10 million. I got to about eight. And then I was in a position where I could buy someone else's practice. And I was like, okay, I don't want to do this under this umbrella. I'm going to go to Schwab and see if they'll take me. And I went to Schwab and I was like, hey, I've got eight, but I've got a, I can, I've got a practice I'm about to buy. I can be at 10 million within six months. And they said, you better get to the 10 million. I said, send me the paperwork and Money Script Wealth Management was born. So what advice would you give younger, newer advisors coming to the industry today and, and getting started? First piece of advice is you've got to be a, stu a student of this game first. I'm constantly looking for um, credentials that I can get. Uh, so just last year, I got my business financial advisor, or not business, excuse me, behavioral financial advisor designation. And, and that really, that, that also helped compel a lot of getting new clients last year because I was able to, to really stand in what I, I believed all this time. I was like, oh, this is what I've been looking for to be able to relate the financial behaviors to values and goals. So, so the first thing I would say is, you, is you, coming into this business, you, you get to, to decide to be a student as well, a lifelong student. Constantly look for ways to, that you can improve the level of value and service that you provide to your clients. The next thing I would say is, is don't get too attached to whatever firm you may be hanging, you know, that may be on your business card because firms, firms change. I mean, I remember being at Ameriprise when, you know, we got the directive from up above. It's like everybody that's below this production level, you've got 90 days to either get them above or they're gone. And I lost some, what I felt were good people. I was like, oh, you know, this person just had a string of bad circumstances, but I still think they can be a valuable, a valuable um, advisor and, uh, and, a, and a person in the, you know, advisor community. But Sorry, because you missed it by a dollar. I got to let you go. So, so I, I would I would encourage you to to if if you're going to go with you know one of the big box firms or something like that to to just know that it that may not be where you are 20 years from now, but make sure that you're creating value in the relationship that you have with your clients because that's one thing that these firms have all learned over the years is that they don't own the clients. They don't. The clients have a relationship with that advisor and. And a lot of firms, sometimes you try to use some very sticky financial products to, to keep people around. And I know it because I sold a lot of them myself. But, uh, you know, I, to this day, I have clients, I'm included. My life insurance policies are still at River Source Financial <laughs> or River Source Insurance with Ameriprise because it costs me too much money to undo it. And I'm not in the same, you know, <laughs> I'm not in the same health or age that I was when I first signed up for them. But I still have clients that also still have those insurance po policies. And they'll say to me, shouldn't we move this somewhere else? You don't work there anymore. I'm like, no. It, it's a great product. You know, it, it's serving its purpose. It's fine right where it is. You know, I can still help you manage the product itself. I don't care whose name is on it. I care the value that it's providing for you in your life. So, so just understand that, that you get to make those relationships with those individuals. And if you decide you want to go off on your own one day, start your own firm or go to another firm or partner with somebody else, what have you, if you've built those solid relationships with those clients, they're going to, they'll, they'll go with you. They will go with you. And, and the final thing in, in that same space is, after spending so many years in corporate and now being RIA, give me all the headaches of the RIA every other, every day of the week. I have zero desire. I, I get calls all the time. Oh, you know, we'll buy your practice. We'll do this. But no, 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 no. Yeah, I'll sell my practice when I'm ready to not do this anymore at all. And even then, I'm hoping that's one of my children that are the buyers. But I, I think there is something to be said for the individuals that are willing to go out there and try to create you know, the practice, the way they want to do it. As long as you're doing it in a compliant manner and you're taking care of people and, and creating value in people's lives. And I, I, I say, go for it. So I, I think that if you want to be in this business, I think you get to entertain the idea of what if you built it yourself or what if you went to a company that promoted you building it yourself versus just being behind some, some big box label. As we wrap up, this is a, a podcast about success. And, you know, one of the themes is just even the word success means different things to different people, sometimes even changes for us as we go through the stages of our life. And so as someone who's you building the successful business and growing the team and growing clients and adding a, a client a week on an ongoing basis right now, it's an incredible growth rate. I'm just wondering, how, how do you define success for yourself at this point? 
I define success today by measuring the problems I'm solving and value I'm creating in other people's lives. I measure success by the phone call that I got from a client in, in April of last year. He left an urgent message. I need to call. I need you to call me. It's urgent. We, we got to talk. And, and, uh, and he's one of my first clients. He's that podiatrist. So he was my second doctor client ever. So he's been with me for, you know, 18 years now. So when he says it's urgent, I'm like, this might be pretty important. And so I, I call him back and he's like, hey, I just looked at my 401k and I know you told me I, not to worry about it. And, and I'm not, I'm not worried about it. I'm down 30%, but I'm not worried. I'm not retiring. I'm like, please, sir, to get to the point, what, what, what's the concern? He said, I haven't looked at my 529 statement. And you know that my son starts college in the fall. He got accepted and college is going to cost us like 20 grand a year. What are we going to do if I had lost, you know, 20, 30 percent of the five to nine? And I just laughed. I was like, oh, was like, are you serious? Really? He's like, yeah. He's like, why, why are you not worried? Do you already have a plan? How are we going to make the money back? I was like, you didn't lose any money. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, it's an age based portfolio. He's 17 years old. It's like 20 percent equities, 80 percent in bonds. It's like, how much am I down? It's like, let me look. It's like, you're down 4%. That's it? It's like, yeah, that's it. He was like, how did you know? I was like, I didn't. What I did know, I didn't know that COVID was going to happen, the market was going to fall. What I did know is that the closer you got to the goal, the less risky we had to be with the money. So I set it up in a way that we wouldn't have to worry about it. He was like, you mean to tell me 18 years ago, you, you set it up this way? Yes. He was like, I, he was like that's incredible. He was like, I... And, and, and that was the end of the conversation. We turned and we started talking about something else. But that for me was a winning moment. Like I was so excited. And that is how I, I measure success. I measure success when the client calls me and says, we closed on our house. Thank you. I didn't think this was possible three years ago. And I'm glad I waited until now. Can you imagine if I tried to do this three years ago when I first met you and you were like, uh, maybe you should have a cash reserve first before you go and you know sign on the dotted line. I was like, the bank will give you the money all day. I was like, they don't care. FHA is backing that loan. They could care less. You know, I said, but are you ready for that? And from what I can see, you probably aren't. So, so that I measure success by the amount of people that are saying, thank you because of what you, the information you provided or the action you helped me take, helped me to create more generational wealth for, for my family or help me be able to provide this opportunity for my family. Or, or for instance, the client that called me and said, my wife just had an aneurysm at work. She's in the hospital. They say she's going to be okay, but are we going to be okay financially? And I'm like, mm, I mean, it's not going to be easy, but if you're asking financially, I was like, yeah, she's got disability insurance. She'll be fine. Does this cover, does it cover aneurysms? I was like, if she can't work, it, it's covered. And sure, I mean, she's, she's back at work now, but she's only working part-time. And then the question was, oh my gosh, but she's not totally disabled and her disability from work is going to cut her off because she's coming back to work. I was like, don't worry. We put partial disability on this policy. How did you know? I didn't. I just know that most disabilities are partial. They just are. Very few people are totally disabled. Most of them are partial. They start partial and then turn into something. And not part of that's because my mother was partially and then fully disabled. So I lived it. So, so that I measure success by the, the, the amount of times that, that clients are able to say, thank you. You helped show me how to do something differently. And it's, I don't measure success by the client says, oh, we made a, you know, a bunch of money on ABC stocks. No, 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 we didn't. It went up. We had nothing to do with that. Okay. But when you say, Hey, you had me sell that stock that I had that went up a whole lot. And now I have the cash to, you know, do something, you know, more reasonable with it instead of speculating on what the next hot stock's going to be. Uh, that's how I measure. So it's, it's the value that's being created in other lives, in others' lives, the financial problems that we're able to solve in others' lives. And, and, and that's what, what uh, gets me up in the morning. I love it. I, I love it. Thank you, Johan, so much for joining us on the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thank you. And thank you to all the listeners for uh, allowing the space for, for me to share this story. And this, this is the first time publicly I've really told the story about how I left Ameriprise. So that, that, was, a little, uh, <laughs> that was a little much for me, but, uh, but thank you for asking it and just letting me answer. But it felt good to get it off my chest. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's unfortunately, it's part of the challenging journeys, right? We've all got these setbacks. Almost no one really gets the, the, the straight line path to, to growth. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I, I like that. That's that whole that, that meme or whatever that goes around that shows this, what people think the, the line to success and it's just a straight line up and, and what it really is. And it's the squiggly line that's all over the place that you can't really follow. Yeah. I've been on that squiggly line for <laughs> until now. Still on it. It's still squiggly.
Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Michael. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits, along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.